Hello and welcome to episode 5 of the Protection Dog Podcast. This is Joel and I am going to be talking to you today about training philosophy, at least our dog training philosophy. My eyes just got fuzzy there for a second, sorry about that. And um, But before we get started, let's talk about our sponsor for today, it is Canine Academy. So Canine Academy Online is making dog training easy for you. We offer local and online training. Uh, we offer obedience, service dog training, tracking, protection training, and tactical training. You can find out more information and contact us at our website, which is canineacademyonline.com. And that's the letter K, the number nine, academyonline.com. You can also email us at joel at fortresscanine.com. You can text me with any questions that you might have, 813-836-9244. You can also check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Our handles are at Canine Academy Online on both Facebook and Instagram, and you can just search for Canine Academy Online on YouTube and find us there. Uh, I wanted to update you guys. Uh, we still have puppies available in the Dutch Shepherd litter and the Malinois litter. So if you're looking for solid working dogs and, uh, and you want to start with a puppy, uh, maybe you want a protection dog like we talk about here, but you can't afford the thirty dollars to $75,000 investment for a fully trained dog, then you can purchase a puppy and go through the Canine Academy online and uh, do all the training yourself. So that is an option for those who are interested. All right, so let's get into the topic for today. We are gonna talk about training philosophy. Now everybody's gonna have kind of their own version of this in terms of dog trainers and uh, even handlers, although um, a lot of handlers don't really get into the training aspect that much. Um, but everybody kind of has their philosophy of dogs, whether you think about it or you don't think about it, and um, I hear a lot of people say similar things when we get into uh, talking about dog training or just the conceptualizing how dogs perceive things and all of this kind of stuff. Uh, one that I hear a lot is things like being the alpha male or the alpha of the pack or things of that nature. And, uh, and so we're gonna discuss a little bit of all those things today um, so that you can kind of hear what makes us a little bit different, um, why we think the way that we do, and uh, and then how that kind of influences uh, what we do with our dogs. So the first one, I have, I have basically what I call the 12 pillars of dog training uh, is what makes up our dog training philosophy. And um, the first one is you must be consistent. All right, so dogs thrive off of patterns and consistency. And so a lot of times what happens is we set patterns that we don't want and then we're inconsistent with doing or requiring what we do want. So it's kind of like a double-edged sword that whoa, that we create this issue. And the, the way that we get over it is we have to start intentionally being consistent in everything that we do. All right, so the more consistent you can be, the more intentionally consistent you can be, the more good patterns that you set, the better you're gonna be with your dog, right? So whenever your dog is doing something that you don't like, that's frustrating you, um, that is problematic in one way or another, ask yourself, what am I doing that's creating this, act, this behavior from the dog? And what do I need to change and be consistent in to get the dog to react and act and do and behave the way that I want them to, right? So um, that's a very, very helpful thing to do whenever you're having any kind of problem. That's one of the first things I look for when somebody comes in there like, I'm having this issue with my dog. I say, okay, let's come over here and start doing some work. And I'm watching not so much the dog, although the dog will communicate when it's about to do things, and I, I help handlers see and understand that, but more than what the dog is doing and saying, I'm watching what the handler is doing and saying. Not what they think they're doing and saying, but what they're actually doing and saying, and then watching what, how are they communicating to the dog, and where are they creating confusion in that communication. So being consistent, it also applies to communication with the dog, 
and uh, and we're gonna get into that a little bit more in a minute but make sure you're consistent as you go through and in the areas that you have consistent problems I can almost guarantee you are being consistent but not the way you want to be in those settings right the next one is one direction one correction and praise so in our training philosophy we don't use toys and treats and all these other kinds of things our reward our payment to the dog for doing what we're, at, we're commanding them to do is we, we reward them by praising them by telling them good job you did what I wanted right and that takes the form of if I say sit I tell my dog seats they sit I say good seats my dog I tell them to plutz they lay down I say good plutz right if I want my dog to track for me I will tell them to seek it out they will begin their tracking and when we are successful they get they get told good seek usually it's and very excited in that particular setting it's more like good seek got a boy good seek and then lots and lots of praise right and lots and lots of petting in that situation so um, there are a few things where we use a lot of petting to kind of build the desire in the dog to do something specific um, but the the communication is praise when they do what we ask them to do, okay? And sometimes our praise is excited and sometimes our praise is more calm and mellow, just depending on the reaction we, we want and expect from the dog and how much work the dog had to give us to get that praise. The more work they had to do, the more praise they're going to get because we want them excited for next time we ask them to do that level of work for us. But where most people, and so let me just stay on that for just one second. So when we start talking about praise, one of the things that I notice is, and it's more of a problem for guys than for girls, but I see it both ways, is people's dog will do what they want. And usually I see this when the dog's either learning obedience or maybe being just a little bit disobedient. So, you know, maybe the person says uh, seats to the dog to sit down. They don't sit, they give them their correction or they fuss at him a couple times, you know, knock it off seats. Hey, come on, for you, seats. And then they sit and then they don't tell the dog good seats, right? Because they're a little bit frustrated in their in their mind. And uh, and so the dog finally does it and it's more kind of just like a hunk than good seats, right? So one of the things that we have to start getting over is our own emotional baggage that we bring into the situation. And when we tell the dog to sit and they sit, then we say good seats. When we tell the dog to lay down, they lay down, good plutz for us. That's our command, the plutz is to lay down. So whatever your commands are, if you're gonna praise according to the methodology that we use, you say good and then the command that you just used to get them to do whatever it was they were doing. Now, now let's go back to what happens before that happens though. So a lot of times people give the, the command to the dog and the dog won't do the command and they'll just continue repeating the command until the dog does it, right? And, and a lot of times this is three, four, five times before the dog responds to the command. What happens when you do that is you are establishing a form of communication with the dog that is going to be what you're going to have to do in the future unless you fix it. So if you're always having to tell the dog three, four, five times to do something before they do it, then you're going to have to always tell the dog three, four, five times before they do something, right? And if you are trying to develop a well-mannered, obedient dog, that is going to be counterproductive to your um, success at trying to get that done. So we use the philosophy of one direction, one command, one direction. So I give the command, sit. Okay, so for us we would say seats. If the dog sits, then they get praised, good seats. If the dog does not sit, if they fail to obey the command for some reason, Hear that? In two miles, we got to turn. So when I tell my dog to sit, if they don't sit, then they get a correction, which most of the time, depending on where the dog is in their training levels, and we get into way more detail in this in the Canine Academy online videos, but most of the time it would be a physical correction, so a pop with the prong collar, and a verbal correction at the same time, fooey that, so it's a bump and fooey that simultaneously, and then we can repeat the command again. So depending on what level of obedience your dog already has and all this sort of thing, 
if they're highly obedient but they're blowing you off, then maybe you give a harder correction. If they're very early into the training portion of this and, um, and they're still trying to figure it all out, then the correction is much, much lighter, right? And, um, and then if you're introducing a command, we're actually not going to intentionally correct at all. We're going to direct until the dog has an understanding of what it is they're supposed to be doing. So that's number two, one direction, one correction, and praise. So what's not directly in these, um, but that has kind of developed itself. I love it when Siri tells me where to do, what to do. All right, so um, what's kind of developed itself into this communication as I've trained with more and more and more people is explaining to people one important aspect of this is giving direction in a way that's consistent for the dog. So in half a mile, keep right onto US 17 North towards Sanford. Whenever I have one of these turns, she's always got to tell me like five times what to do. All right, so what happens is we have three primary forms of communication with the dog. There's other like smaller forms of communication, but our three primary forms of communication are our verbals. Right onto US 17 North towards Sanford. So it'll be what we say, right? So we can that's usually the commands that we give to the dog and then it's also how we say it so if we say it in a you know calm manner then the dog will react usually in a more relaxed manner if we say it in an intense manner like you know something really intense is going on the dog will typically respond faster if we say it in an angry manner um, the dogs will react to that typically as well all right so we have our verbals the number two that we do in our communication is we have our lead direction. So that's how we direct the dog by pulling on the lead in various different ways or using the lead to correct the dog with. And then our third one is our gestures. And that is how we move with the dog. So a gesture could be pointing at something you want the dog to get on or walk across or something like that. A gesture could also be um, the way that you move your body as you're approaching different things. So if you approach a table and your approach is like you're going to get up on the table or like you're gonna get right up next to the table, then a lot of times that will encourage the dog to jump up on the table because they're responding to that gesture that you just did, right? And so all of these three forms of communication need to say the same thing to the dog quarter mile, take or- a right turn onto Park Drive. You hear that? Or we're giving confusing communication to the dog. So we wanna try and be as consistent as possible in that and if we're the ones not being consistent and not saying the same thing with all three forms of communication, then in that particular setting, we may work on that a little bit first before we correct the dog for it, or at least before we give the dog any kind of serious correction. Um, you can train the dogs to respond to one over the other, and we do specific training for that, especially with like service dogs. So if I, <clears throat> if I want my dog to respond to um, my vocal command and ignore my lead direction so that I can use the dog to pull myself up out of a sitting position, for instance. So if somebody has a mobility issue, they need to sit up and they need their dog to assist them. So they grab the lead and they pull on it just to pull themselves into a sitting position. Continue then you have to train the, the right dog. to take a slight right turn onto park drive. Yeah. So then you have to train the dog to ignore the direction they're receiving from the lead in that particular setting, right? In that particular situation. And so you Use can the right train them to do that. Slight right turn onto Park Drive. All right, so now we're gonna move on to number three. I'm supposed to take a slight right turn onto Park Drive. Here I go, woohoo! Just took my slight right turn. So number three is mile, discipline. Right onto East 25th Street. She's kind of annoying me. Now we're gonna talk about discipline and control. So discipline and control is basically not allowing yourself to become lazy in your handling of your dogs, right? So all dogs that have training, in order to maintain that training, you have to handle the dog. You have to put work into it. Some dogs are gonna be easier, excuse me, some dogs are gonna be easier, so they're, um, you know, maybe like a pet or some dog that's real mellow, um, might not take nearly as much work. A dog that has more energy might take more work or at least more discipline in your work. And, um, but discipline and control would fall into right, things like, right onto East 25th Street. got it, turn right onto East 25th Street. So discipline and control would fall into something like if you're sitting on the couch and you're enjoying, you know, TV or whatever, and then the dog gets out of their place, 
and uh, that's one of the commands we use place for them to go to a certain spot and lay down so if I'm sitting down relaxing my dog is out of their place rather than consistently just going hey knock that off go back to your place right if you want them to actually stop doing that behavior you have to get up and correct them and then they will stop doing that behavior if you stay lazy if you're not disciplined when that happens then what will end up happening over time is the dogs will realize oh I can just pretty much do whatever I want you will might fuss at me for it but then I can just go and, and do what you told me to after you fuss at me because you're not gonna actually come and correct me for it whereas if you get up and you actually physically correct the dog when they do that kind of stuff then they will go it's not worth getting up for and they stay in their place so they do whatever the command is right and then control is essentially being aware of your movements your body your vocals and all of that kind of stuff and then a appropriately applying that to the situation right so one example that we use a lot is when I communicate to my dog if I want them to go slow or to slow down or to be careful in a certain area I'll tell them easy right but a lot of times when I watch my clients they will want their dog to go easy through something right so maybe we're doing a ladder or something like that right they're, they're walking across a ladder and the, the, they want their dog to slow down so they say it like this easy 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 and if you notice each each one of those and it got more intense as it went but each one of those the easy starts off on more on the mellow side and by the time I'm finished saying the word I have communicated stress not relaxation right so if I want my dog to move easy I say easy easy now if they don't if they don't easy then I pop them I say for you that with a pop easy right so my communication has told them hey I told you to be easy you're not being easy so now I'm gonna correct you and I'm going to repeat the command easy but my vocal doesn't ramp up if it does then even though I'm saying the word easy I'm not communicating easy so therefore when we talk about discipline and control I'm not controlling my own verbal I'm allowing the situation to control my verbal and therefore I'm losing control of the situation so that would be an example of discipline and control as a handler and as a trainer you must have discipline and control all right so point number four is train under realistic stress all right so the point behind this because a lot of people will take this point and they'll think something along the lines of you know oh I gotta train under gunfire or whatever the case may be right um, what the point of train under realistic stress is is whatever is realistic for your life right so maybe you don't have a protection dog at all maybe what you are training your dog to do is to be um, a service dog right so you have a service dog and you need to look at your life and say what kind of things am I going to be exposed to what kind of things are we going to encounter together as a team and then we need to train specifically for those things rather than um, you know just doing kind of like a basic obedience or things of that nature right so if you uh, have a service dog and you routinely or, or even you know on a uh, non-routine basis let's say you go to Lowe's right and Lowe's those big plywood or uh, lumber carts that they have there in Lowe's way more noisy than your average shopping cart you need to train for that if you move in places where there are escalators you need to train for that if you're training a protection dog then you need to train for what it is you're going to do so if you have a dog um, that's a patrol dog and you're a police officer then you need to train to fight the person while the dog is biting them right because that is a very realistic possibility for you if you have a military working dog your dog needs to train to function under gunfire at least if you have a dog that is potentially going to be up functioning under gunfire right a lot of the dogs even though they're military working dogs are just detection dogs for the most part and um, that's really their only serious job and they do it under semi-controlled environment so maybe for that dog um, just you know doing the searches 
in hot climates, doing the searches in an environment that is gonna be a realistic thing that you're gonna to have to deal with in the real world is what you're looking for. So when you say train under realistic stress, we're not just referring to things like combat stress, we're referring to whatever the stresses that you face in your life are, you and your dog need to be trained to deal with that so that you're fully functional and you're not running into these issues after the fact, right? You don't wanna be finding out that these are problems when, um, when you're in the midst of the problem. You want to have prepared for these things. There may still be a little bit when you actually are truly in real world um, versus the training environment that you're working in. But if you've done the training, if you've prepared for the, the event, then you're gonna be way better off than you would be had you not done that realistic stress training in the first place. All right, so that's number four. It's very broad, it applies uh, broadly. Now when we get into um, the protection dog specific stuff, that is one of the areas where we, Fortress K9, K9 Academy, have a fairly large distinction from a lot of other places, right? And so, um, and, and there's various different reasons and rationale behind these, so I'm not going to totally bash the, the opposing rationale because um, everybody kind of has their perspective on how things work. Uh, and we talked a couple weeks ago about um, dealing with a fight, the, the realistic aspect of what happens in a fight. But from our perspective, we do not want the dogs doing what's typically referred to as a full mouth bite or a deep bite or a bite and hold type of, of bite. Um, there are certain applications where that might be beneficial, but for the most part in a protection scenario, from our perspective, I don't want that. Because if I'm fighting a dog and I'm going to try to harm or injure or kill a dog that I'm fighting, the dog that does the bite and hold is the easiest to kill. Um, the dog that bites, causes injury, thrashes, and then moves to another spot so that it's causing a secondary injury and a third injury and a fourth and on and on and on it goes depending on how long the fight lasts. That is the dog that is extremely difficult to defeat, right? You have a knife and you're trying to stab at a dog. Um, you have some kind of blunt weapon and you're trying to hit the dog with it. The dog that stays attached, there's an initial amount of pain that's associated with that. And then the person functions. Either people, so when, this is something that's really important to understand um, when we're talking about protection dogs and training under realistic stress. When somebody is in a real fight, they get an endorphin adrenaline rush into their system, right? And that's what gives them increased strength, it gives them um, kind of that initial burst of energy that is often brought into these fights in the, right off the bat, right? One of the things that these chemicals do for us is they're, they, they numb our pain. We don't feel pain or we feel it substantially less than we would if we didn't get the adrenaline and the endorphin rush, right? So when a dog bites a person, pain is is a consideration, right? But creating a pain point and then staying at that point is not gonna have the effect that it has for somebody when they're not in the midst of that fight, right? So a lot of people think, oh no, um, you know, my dog's gonna bite somebody and they're just gonna quit, right? Well, maybe, maybe that happens and there, there are a percentage of people who when they hit that level of stress, that level of pain, that level of uh, conflict, they do just shut down, right? And so a lot of times police are dealing with these people. They're criminals who aren't out to kill anybody or anything like that. They're just trying to run away, right? Or they're just being very non-compliant. Like they're combative, but they're not combative in a fist fight way, they're combative in a, I'm not gonna do anything you say kind of way, right? And because they maybe they're near a weapon or maybe they, you know, they're in specific situations, it justifies the dog bite. Um, or the person's hiding somewhere, like say a warehouse or something like that. And the dog's going in 
And in those situations, those people typically don't want the fight anyway. So when the dog comes in and engages with them, they just kind of curl up into a ball. And they're like, ah, I don't want anything. I don't want any part of this. From a personal perspective, or personal protection perspective, from a personal protection standpoint, if you're not gonna be dealing with those kinds of people. The people that don't want the conflict aren't going to come to you as an individual leaving a grocery store or you in your home during a home invasion. They're, they're, the people who don't want the fight aren't the people who do those crimes. The people who do the crimes of you know, rape, kidnapping, home invasion, the things that if you need a personal protection dog, those are the things that you're trying to protect yourself against primarily. Those people are willing to have the fight. And so you're dealing with an entirely different kind of a person than you are for an apprehension dog, right? An apprehension dog may face those kinds of people down the road at some point, and, but that's not the bulk of what they're doing. Also, a police officer has the obligation to go in and go hands-on with somebody once they've deployed their dog on them. If you are not a highly trained person in terms of hand-to-hand -hand, uh, conflict and you have to use your dog, you probably don't want to go get tangled up with that person if you can help it. So, having a dog that will do the fighting for you and then release and come back to you when the time comes, that's what we are training for. And again, I don't bash any of these other things because there are specific applications that produced the desire to create that dog in the first place. Sometimes it's liability, right? So in, in a police department, their dogs, they're gonna have multiple dog bites every year. Let, let's say they have you know five dogs in their canine program. They're probably gonna have 25 or 30 dog bites a year that they have to deal with. And every one of these, or probably a decent portion of them anyway, are going to sue the police department because they got hurt, right? Because the dog bit them. And so they're gonna have to deal with these. So if their dog does a singular bite, very minor puncture wounds, very little ripping from the canines, and just a big bruise, Right? Well, that's a lot easier to deal with from a litigation perspective. They're probably not going to have successful lawsuits there, as opposed to a personal protection dog who's creating injury and potentially permanent damage by thrashing and ripping through muscle, right, over and over again. That is a much higher risk level for a police department. Now, for a person who's dealing with a, a threat, you can justify, if you follow our recommended procedures, you can almost always justify the use of the dog and minimize your own liability. But the bottom line is, if you ever have to shoot anybody, if you ever have to fight for your life, and you win, which is obviously all of our objectives, right? If you have to fight for your life and you win, you are probably going to end up being sued on the back end. That's just the world we live in. And I'm not saying that I agree with it. I'm not saying that's a good thing. It's just the reality. And it doesn't do us any good to pretend that we're living anywhere other than reality. So that's my little high horse there for a minute on um, the personal protection dog side of the train under realistic stress. Uh, hopefully that is helpful to you. But let's move on to number five, which is master yourself. Okay, so master yourself kind of takes the, the last several that we've been talking about and wraps them into one, but it's, it's this overarching idea that we have to stop pretending that we are someone we're not. We have to stop pretending we can become someone we aren't. We have to stop pretending that we have some level of expertise that we don't, right? We have to recognize where we are and that's, this can apply to multiple different things, right? But we have to recognize where we are and then move to where we want to be, move in that direction from where we actually are. And this is something that is very, very difficult for people because we all want to believe we're better than we are. And in reality, we all want to believe we're good, right? That we're good people. And the bottom line is none of us are good. 
there's certain aspects of things that we do that are good, but if you take the overarching aspect of your life, you're selfish, you lie, you probably at least think about cheating on your partner. I mean, there's just all sorts of issues within us and pretending that we don't have these doesn't solve any problems. Addressing them and saying, yep, that's me. Now, what can I do to be better? Is always the solution rather than pretending that we just don't have the problems that we have. Okay, so when we talk about mastering ourselves, this would apply in the dog training realm from the perspective of let's not pretend that we that we as the handler and our dog are more trained than we actually are. Rather than training or trying to prepare for looking good, let's train so that we find our weaknesses and then we can start working on fixing them or, or making them not as big a weaknesses, right? And, and it's, a, it's a fundamental shift in thinking that initially isn't huge, but the results of thinking this way, the results of training this way, the results of moving in this direction in our thoughts, long term, has a massive, massive impact, all right? So that is master yourself. We have to stop pretending that we're somewhere we're not. We have to accept where we are, take responsibility for it because we're the only ones responsible, right? There's lots of things outside of our control, but the only one who can control us is us. So we have to recognize we're the only ones responsible and then we start doing the things that get us to where we want to be. And uh, so that is point number five, master yourself. And then point number six, which is gonna be the last one for this episode and we will pick up and finish these off in the next episode, is you are responsible. So this is a good segue from mastering yourself is you are responsible. All right, so here's why this is so critical. In my years of training, I've seen a lot of dogs and handlers fail, right? And, and most of the time it's minor failures, right? Like the dog's supposed to wait somewhere and they get up and they move. Or the dog is supposed to um, bite in a certain scenario and they don't, right? Whatever it is, they're tracking, and they don't find who they're looking for, right? I would say 97% of those cases, who gets the blame for the failure? And in 97% of those cases, the, who got the blame was the dog. The handlers blamed the dog. Who should have gotten blamed for the failure is the handler because you, are always responsible, okay? So the dog works for you, you're responsible. Now, there are situations where a dog is either incapable of doing a certain task or their foundation wasn't properly set up for that task, okay? Scent work is a good example of this. If a dog hasn't been brought into scent work at an early enough time, then there's a good possibility that they're just not going to excel at it, even if they would have excelled at it had they been brought into it when they were younger, right? Or maybe a dog was brought into something the wrong way and now you're dealing with the kind of the blowback from that um, as, as a handler. So in those situations, we would say, you personally may not be responsible for the fact that the dog may or may not be able to do that now, right? But you are still responsible for the outcome. So let's just say for an example, because I want to make this make sense. Let's just say that the your dog was not properly brought into tracking, but you're called out to track. Then you need to be responsible and say, my dog doesn't track. Now, all dogs track technically, but in order to have successful tracks, you have to have a dog that's determined in the track and you have to have a handler who's willing to go through and who's determined to find the person as well because tracking it can be really, really difficult depending on how much the person wants to get away 
or, or how lost they are, or whatever the case may be, where they got lost. All of those things play a big factor, but if, that, if you're not a tracking team, then rather than saying, okay, yeah, we'll do it, and then failing and then blaming the dog, you go, we're not a good fit for that. Now, maybe you'll say something like, well, we'll try, but we're not a good fit. But you still have to be responsible. You are responsible, okay? I kind of refer to protection dogs, and really this applies to all dogs, but protection dogs specifically, is to help people understand their dog and, and their level of responsibility in the whole situation is I'll say, dogs are like really obedient three-year-olds with guns, right? So they will do whatever you tell them to do if they're well-trained, but you don't want them making their own decisions for the most part. Right? Because once they're left to their own devices to make their own decisions, they're probably not going to make a decision you want them to make. So when we start getting into things like tracking and scent work and protection work and all these other situations, you are the brain of the team. It's not that dogs don't have brains and it's not that they don't think, but they don't have anywhere near the level of ability to reason and think rationally as the human side of the team does. So they bring a set of senses that we don't have and their mouth and their teeth, right? To the team and we bring the ability to think to the team. And when we match those things up and pair them up, we have a lot of success. But when we don't, that's when we run into problems. So you are responsible. We need to start getting used to that. If something goes wrong, we say, my fault, I'll fix it. And usually, if we're talking dogs, then fixing it means going and training and figuring out how to overcome whatever uh, caused the problem in the first place. So hopefully that's been helpful. We will pick up on um, pillars 7 through 12 in our next episode. If you have enjoyed this episode uh, and this podcast so far, don't forget to subscribe. Tell your friends about it so that they can subscribe. I uh, would love to hear your thoughts, good, bad, indifferent things that you would like to hear us talk about in the comments. Uh, so please leave your comments and uh, let me know what you think. And until next time, train hard and stay safe.